Uh, Sue Maroney. Mr Chair, and at, at the outset of my contribution on part two of this bill, can I just place on record um, the bizarre sort of bureaucracy speak that, uh, that pervades throughout this bill, including in part two, where strangely the, um, the person who I would call the primary parent, who actually is providing the main parenting role, is described as a carer. And the person who does the paying, and not so much the parenting, gets the word parent attached to them, liable parent, as opposed to primary carer. And it's something that I would like to see in future actually resolved through this bill, because it, it does um, seem to me that we attach the word parent um, in quite the wrong situation there. I would much prefer to see the word parent actually applied to the person who is providing the role of parenting, not the person who simply pays the money for the role of parenting. I think we've got that around the wrong way. But primarily part two is actually about when it all goes pear-shaped. And I guess in some ways you can say it's probably all gone pear-shaped at all before families are even dealing with this bill. But this is when, after the relationship has broken down and there is a problem with the liable parent, the, um, the payer, actually paying what they ought to pay. And so this is the part that actually attempts to deal with that. And I was not on the select committee, except for I, I, I did um, attend briefly to hear um, a bit of the conversation that was going on around this bill, but I'm not a permanent member of the select committee. But I was surprised to learn that the government wouldn't contemplate looking at one of the most effective ways of dealing with liable parent debt and contributions by considering the idea of pass-through. Because there is international evidence that actually one of the best ways to actually improve liable parent payments is uh, to ensure that they know that the money they are paying is not getting lost in some black hole of a huge administrative system, but in fact is finding its way to their child or their children and supporting their upbringing. I'm just, I'm just surprised that the government wasn't prepared to at least look at that, particularly given that we have this huge debt of $2.3 billion, outstanding. And as I think uh, previous contributors to this part of the debate have pointed out, that that has revved up significantly under this government's watch. That it was um, once when, when this government was in opposition that they cried crocodile tears over half a billion dollars worth of debt in this regard. And now that it's at $2.3 billion, well, they're not, even really considered, they're not even really concerned enough about it to look at one of the most effective ways uh, that happens internationally of, of making sure that this debt doesn't continue to accumulate. However, in fairness, $1.6 billion, roughly, of that $2.3 billion of debt is actually um, incurred in penalty payments. So clearly, the current system of penalty payments isn't working. Currently, isn't, it, it, it certainly isn't working because what obviously happens, it would appear, is that once the liable parent accumulates a debt and they start incurring penalties, that becomes even more affordable, unaffordable for them, and so they just continue to ignore it and ignore it and ignore it and hope it goes away. But in fact, it doesn't go away, it just keeps um, going into an accounting exercise that blows out to be $2.3 billion. But in behind that $2.3 billion, uh, Mr Chair, is actually um, a story that the, that the government don't want to talk about, and that, and that is the, the problem of child poverty. And yes, um, this, even this part of the bill, which is all about um, how we can try and get payments happening and, and, um, and a range of issues around penalties and relief and formula assessment and debt collection. Um, that does really, again, underline um, the issue that's at the heart of this, which is about how do we get, how do we actually get those resources to the children who need them? And I'm really disappointed to hear government members opposite say that this bill's got nothing to do with children, that it's all about parents and it's all about administration and it's all about payments. What do they think this is all about? Where do they think this is all ending up? If it's not about the children, if it's just about some bureaucratic exchange of money and it's an accounting exercise, what on earth 
are we here debating a child support bill for? It's as if they're completely divorced from the real world, Mr Chair. Mr Chair? Sue Mr. Chair? Mr Chair, it's as if they're completely divorced from what really goes on in these families. Because if they do not understand the link between what this bill does, the exchange of finances and the proportions in which it's moving that, that finance, then they really need to get out there, start talking to their community and hearing what's really going on. And I know that some of the members opposite, because of their personal experiences, think they've got this nailed. They think they know all about it because they may have personally taken on a new family and personally been responsible for paying for them, but this is about a whole range of families' experiences. It's not about them. It is not about those members opposite and their personal situations. This is about a whole range of situations. Mr Chair, I do want to ask some questions of the Minister in the Chair, because I see in Part 26 of this that we are giving the Court some discretion to actually change the formula assessment in the situation where a re-establishment cost exists. And I was very interested to understand what re-establishment cost actually refers to. What it refers to is um, in the two, two situations that would appear to me, and I just want to check with the Minister that I've got this right. That the first instance that it applies to is that the court may um, change the assessment criteria and formula if the libel parent in the first three years after the relationship has split up, um, if their financial situation changes in a way where the contribution that they are required to make would be 30 per cent or more of their income. That's what I understand that part means, and I would like some clarification that I've got that right. That doesn't bother me so much, but the next bit I'm not so sure about, because I think it then goes on to say that this re-establishment cost could include the court being given the ability to change the formula assessment because the liable parent has got responsibilities for a new family now. So I'd really like some clarification on that, because that is actually um, quite a departure. I think, from where we've been, and I think that that has some real implications with it. Are we giving the court the right to change the formula assessment based on the libel parent, who often happens to be, often seems to be the parent who's made the decision to leave the, the initial family unit, are we saying that if they set up a new family within three years, which will, could actually often mean that they've left that family for another family, because it's quite soon after the relationship's splitting up, does that mean that they get some sort of financial benefit for that? Because that's how it reads to me, Mr Chair, and I think that raises some real questions. Raises some real questions. I'm watching the members opposite who have been on the select committee, and either they don't know whether I'm correct or not, or they're feeling a bit embarrassed by what I'm raising. I'm not sure, because they, they don't seem to be responding at all about the issue that I'm raising here. But I, I would like a response. Well, the member, Mike Saban, says it's not making any sense. If I'm wrong, I'd like to know that. But the way, well, the way I'm reading it, Mr Saban, and you might tell me whether I'm right or wrong, <coughs> is that, so, so correct me if I'm wrong, that within three years, if the liable parent um, because has, has a whole new family that they're establishing and that they're financially responsible for, that the court has got discretion to change the formula assessment for their commitments to their original children, Sorry. to the children who um, this bill is trying to address. Am I correct in that? I'm confused, so I have got it wrong. I'd really like that member, could he please, I'd like him to take the next call please and explain it to me because maybe I have got it wrong. I'm, putting my hand up and saying could potentially have that quite wrong, but that's the way I'm reading this bill, so I would like some clarification on that, Mr Chair, because it's quite... Well, I, I'm, I really am looking for direction on it, because that's how it reads to me. And if I've got it wrong, then I will feel quite relieved. But if I've got it right, if I've got it right, then I'd be really quite concerned about... What, um, what analysis we've had, 
<coughs> what official advice that the Select Committee has had that tells us what the impact would be on the original family and their children. Because, Mr Chair, that's quite a significant departure and it's a serious issue. Jacinda Ardern. <laughs> Mr Chair, and uh, there was quite a lot of... Uh...